Good afternoon. Welcome to this third festival talk. This is the last one of the program of Los Carme del Latte 2021, and we are really, really excited to have with us Shirin Eshat. Please, Shirin. <laughs> and Heinz Peter Schwerfer. They will discuss about the film that we, we, we are going to see tonight. You want to come on stage? Yes. Just a few words to, to introduce our guests. Shirin has not, she doesn't need any, any words because she is very well known and we are happy to, uh, to have Shirin in Florence. So this, is, this is the third time she visits Lo Schermo dell'Arte. We have presented her previous film, uh, Women Without Men and Looking for Um Kultum. Uh, she has been the recipient of the Golden Lion Award at the Venice Biennale in 1991 and the Silver Lion Award at the Film Venice Film Festival in 2009 for Women Without Men. She has exhibited everywhere in the world, internationally in Art Institute of Chicago, in, in, in Italy in uh, Castello di Rivoli in Torino, uh, and then in Mexico City, Museo di Arte Moderno, National Gallery of Victoria in Melbourne, and Whitney Museum in New York, Worker Assembly in Minneapolis, and more recently at Tate Modern in London. Heinz Peter Schwerfel uh, is a filmmaker and art critic, and founder and artistic director of Kino der Kunst Festival in Munich. He works for German edition of Art Kunst magazine for uh, uh, um, Lettre Internationale and Zeit. And he has published several books on contemporary arts, such as uh, Georg Baselitz, Janis Kunelis, and also uh, the, the essays after Art After Ground Zero and Cinema and Art. Um, he is a film director and he has produced and directed uh, many documentaries on contemporary artists. And we have, uh, in Scarmo del Latte, we have presented quite a lot of his productions. Among them, uh, Daniel Buren, Anish Kapoor, uh, Philippe Reno, uh, Christian Boltanski. Don't, uh, uh, well, I, I leave the, uh, the floor to you and Thank you very much again for being with us. Thank you. The idea, first welcome. And the idea of the whole talk is to make Shirin explain a little bit how an artist who works with photography can also work with video make movies and direct operas, because she's uh, directing again in Salzburg next year, Aida, and how is how the relation between all these different kinds of artistic expressions are, whether they are coherent, whether they fit together, or whether they're completely different in operating and also in aesthetical uh, uh, reasons. So let's start a little bit about what you once said uh, in an interview about your art, that whatever you do has an autobiographical uh, basis. And uh, autobiographical as a woman, but uh, especially also as a woman between Orient, Occident, to different civilizations and uh, ways of living. Thank you, Heinz. I wanted to also say I, it's a really honor to be in this festival, which I think is the best possible context for an artist like myself, who's, as Heinz explained, um, is crossing many boundaries, especially between art and cinema. And I think it's a unique opportunity tonight because we'll see the movie of Land of Dreams, but also we'll show you the video um, of Land of Dreams today. Um, I just want to start by saying that um, my art has always stemmed from a very deep obsessions that I've had 
And I think if it wasn't for my political situation um, relating to my country, Heinz, uh, I would not have become an artist. So everything is very personal for me. And I always explain that um, for me, art was not a career move. Art came, um, or my imagination was a way to cope with my own personal anxieties, angst, emotional instability, and political situation. And, and I think to this day, as an artist in exile, um, it's the only thing that it keeps me stable psychologically. Um, and so from an artist like myself, I don't think it's, one could expect anything but personal, not autobiographical, because I don't think my story is so interesting. I think everyone, life is interesting, but for me it's been about creating work that somehow in the narrative or in the character, the emotional, political experiences I've had could be embedded in those characters and narratives. But I don't really want to tell my story per se. Um, and another thing I want to mention is that to me art is it's a form of a fire or an urgency that one feels when you want to make something. It's like you're not really sure what you're doing, but you feel the urgency to do it, to tell the story. But once you get to a point where people establish you and recognize you and praise you and you become successful, that fire dies. And for me, the move toward another medium is almost like keeping that fire going because I don't like the idea of being defined by one thing. I like the idea of reinventing myself and being able to be a new beginner at my old age. I only say that because we have a lot of young artists in this room. Um, and I think that's a problem for artists who become very established, that fire dies and you just repeat yourself. Um, and the last thing before I, I pass it on to you is that, yes, the work began as a form of self-portraiture where I photographed myself and my own body and eventually that changed. This is the Woman of Allah series from the 1990s. From the 1990s, which made you famous. Uh, but, uh, well, you said before it's more about personal and not autobiographical. But this first series was a little bit autobiographical because it was, I think you made it when you had gone back to Iran for the first time after your studies in, in, in the US. It was not autobiographical because I played the role of, uh, I, basically what happened is that I went to Iran after the revolution, after 11 years of absence, and my obsession became a way to reunite with my country and my family. And the major subject at the time was how the Islamic revolution of 1979 had transformed the Iranian society from a secular to a religious society and how the heart of this revolution was fanaticism, religion. And, and I focused on the idea of martyrdom, men and women who were willing to die and kill, commit violence in their faith for God. For me, that was a paradoxical reality. So it was not about me, Heinz, about, it was almost like a, a sociologi sociological point of view of study of people who were religious. Of course, this work wasn't quite understood, but that was my intention. But uh, it was also, it was not because behind us, uh, as we saw before on the photos, behind a quite uh, aggressive or uh, aggressive or uh, polemical provocative form, you never, uh, because many people didn't understand that, that you did not write, for instance, Uh, parts of the Quran or so, but it was uh, poems. So it was already a, a very personal position, um, which was maybe uh, misunderstood, but which, which was a position which is, was completely between uh, uh, militant and uh, 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 political uh, attitudes. 
Yes, I mean, one thing for me was very clear when I made this work that I was an outsider to the Iranian society. Um, at that time, I had not been in the country for 11 years. When people had endured the revolution, the, the war with Iraq, um, the, the, the suffering of the people under the dictatorship of the Islamic Republic of Iran. But I was very careful not to push my own political ideology into the narrative here. I wanted to simply portray my understanding how a typical martyr stood in this intersection of love of God, devotion, self-sacrifice, yes, yet violence, cruelty, and ultimately death. For me, there was this paradox between a woman who gives birth and is full of life and it's erotic, her, her body is very sensual, but is equally capable of, of killing. So the images were a combination of the female body, which is very problematic in the Iranian society, the weapon, which represented this violence, the, the veil, which is obviously a repressive symbol from, or to some people, an idea of liber liberty, and finally the text, which was poetry. So in this work, I tried not to infuse my own point of view, so I made it with a neutral position. But many people, including the Islamic Republic of Iran, the government, found it problematic. The people who hated the government found it problematic. And the Western critics felt that maybe I was sensationalizing violence and, and sort of using the controversy over the fanaticism, the terrorism that was coming from that part of the world and making art. And it was none of that. So that's why I say it was very much misunderstood. The first video work I saw of yours was Turbulent. I think I saw it in Avignon in 99. And it was a work which was as personal as these works, but it was more uh, uh, conceptual in the sense that you had a first way of a narration and confrontation between men and tradition and woman and improvisation through, through music. So what was for you the reason why you went to the moving image from photography? What was the plus? Honestly, I, I look back and I noticed that subconsciously um, all these heavy judgments that came with the woman of Allah the, the way that work was misinterpreted, um, it made sense to me that the work so directly attacked a political idea, meaning the revolution, that it was impossible for people to relate to the work itself because all they could think of is how they imposed their own predetermined political position into the work. Moving to the moving picture opened a door for me in terms of being able to not only escape the realism directly political discourse to be able to get out of the studio, to get out into the world, to be able to incorporate landscape, which my, none of my images had landscape, and to be able to include choreography, music, and move toward an idea of storytelling, even though the, image, the videos were very ly lyrical and, as you said, conceptual and enigmatic, they had beginning, middle, and the end. So this was for me as a challenge to turn my aesthetics and my lens toward a whole different genre and also rebel against my own nature of work, which was now selling and people were you know, profiting. And so this was my own movement, uh, like I said, um, this fire of like making a major shift. And I think many people were very surprised. Another thing was the idea of situating people between two channel projections, it created this almost sculptural, participatory interaction between the screen and the audience. So the audience couldn't simultaneously see everything. So they had to use their own choice and they almost become an editor to how they conceive the story. I remember that you said also uh, 20 years ago that that the, the, the video, the moving image was a way for you to have a communication around the world without langu link language, without in another uh, visual language which was understood by everybody because it was more or less, even if it was more conceptual or, or poetic, the, the language of Hollywood. 
Yeah, I mean, I turned toward fiction. I think my work was always very stylized with the photographs, but with the moving picture came um, poetry, um, came almost magic realism. Nothing was believable. Uh, I don't have images here, but with rapture, 100 women by the beach, 100 men on the fortress, them going together, to, and it felt like a dance choreography. Nothing really made sense, but there was a strong, very concise idea behind it, even a social critique about the masculine and feminine in the Iranian society. But it was all done in such an allegorical, metaphoric way. So I found with the medium of the moving picture, you had a lot more possibility with the way you moved the camera, the way you used production design, sound, um, choreography, performance. There was all these elements that, that impacted the audience where a single photograph could not possibly do. To me, the, the image, everything had to be read in this one image, where with the moving picture was a progression of images. And that's really how my videos began. Photographs started to move. And, and so uh, to me, it was, it was the beginning of my interest in fiction, magic realism, surrealism, eventually dreams. Um, before we come to the dreams, and to Land of Dreams. Your first movie was still very close to the video because it took the formal aspects of the videos into cinema. There was already another narration than in videos, but it was still, uh, than in your videos and installations, but it was still very close in a formal way to videos. Well, when I first started to um, take this other leap moving from many, many video installations where people say, ah, oh, she's the artist who makes this double channel project projections. Now I did the same thing as was with the photographs. I said, I'm going to stop making these videos. And now I took a few years to make the first movie called Women Without Men, which was based on a novel by Shahnusha Parsipur, a very famous uh, author who was in prison for many years. But it's a beautiful story that followed the lives of a few women simultaneously following the journey of a country going through a coup d'etat. So for me, that itself was a beautiful poetry. Um, if my work were somehow always this parallel between my own little singular personal self and life and angle, yet my interest in the broader, bigger world that was much bigger above and beyond my little life. Women Without Men pursued two, th two things in the same time. And, and, and it had the foot in reality and it had the foot in absolute surrealism. So this was easier for me as a video artist whose work is very much stylized and not believable to be able to dive in to a novel that was magic realism. Because yes, there were elements of history and believability, um, but then once you went to an orchard, orchard nothing made sense. Um, the orchard never had a wall, the people, this woman lived there without any protection, without any communication with the rest of the world. So with this film, I discovered a way to work with narratives that just like my video art, I could still tackle important socio-political religious issues, but still stay highly fictional and allegorical and almost surrealistic, which in my mind are, are more truthful than realistic films. Uh, fictional in relation also to the art of portrait, because you were never really interested in psychological portraits in your photography. It was more than this. Now we come to Land of Dreams, where you have a main character, Simin, who uh, is uh, Iranian in the United States and asks the people uh, to take their photographs. And when they agree and let her in their house, uh, she asks also about dreams. Tell me a little bit about this relation, portrait, photography, dream? Well, first of all, after making so many videos and movies where I was put out into the world, I, I went back to my photography and I realized that my photography were either self-portraitures or portraits of my friends. But this time, it I took a big leap. 
I started to take photographs of real people. I would go to Egypt. I did a whole series um, commissioned by the Rauschenberg Foundation where I interviewed and photographed um, maybe 20, 30 elderly Egyptians after the Egyptian revolution who had lost their children and had suffered a lot. I ended up photographing them as I collected their stories and eventually translated, I don't have the images, and, and wrote those uh, texts on their faces. Eventually, um, I became not just a conceptual photographer, but almost like a reporter. My work became semi-documentary, where I really, really enjoyed, um, I also did this in Azerbaijan, where I would go to new communities, which I didn't know, they were not my country, and I, I got to know people and be able to get to know them, but always under a particular subject. So just going to Land of Dreams, um, I did the same thing. I came up with a concept of an Iranian woman photographer who actually played in the video and the movie. Uh, I went to New Mexico um, with two other women and my dog, and I basically photographed 200 people in different cities of New Mexico from people who were African American, Native American, Hispanic, white, rich, poor, functional, dysfunctional, young, old, and basically tried to collect their dreams and, and, and really trying to understand them. So again, I put myself in this position of, you know, getting to know them and them getting to know me. Eventually, what they said was translated into Farsi, and we inscribed the interpretation of their dreams in the background of these people. The idea of these images were trying to capture a portrait of America. This is in the post-Trump era, where there was this question about the identity of America, and in my mind, the diversity of faces, ethnicities, and races of people is what America looked like. And, and for me, by capturing the different faces was reiterating the very core of American identity, the land of dreams, a place that gave opportunity to those who were displaced, what we call the dreamers, and a country that was built by the blood of immigrants and how this whole idea was being compromised with Trump and his the rise of conservatism, which is still exists with the white supremacists. The move against immigration, Muslim ban, and racism. So these images ultimately created a salon-like installation where the viewer entered a room, 110 photographs of all these faces looking at the audience and their dreams were written in the back of their images. These are some of the shots of the different installations that I've done. Um, it was a major break of you to have a view on America and not any more of uh, the collision between the Eastern and Western world, but really on America and Americans. What made uh, this break possible? Was it the Trump era? Was it uh, uh, the political uh, situation? Because it was before all the, uh, uh, the movements of revolt and racism uh, came out. It was uh, more related to Trump, I think. It's really a combination uh, of two things. Uh, first of all, I have not been able to return to my country since 1996 and my family still live there. And I reached a, a, an end to this nostalgia of a desire to return home. And always going to Morocco, to Turkey, to Azerbaijan, to Mexico, to make films and work that make believe that is Iran. And, and so I, I came, Heinz, to realization after, I mean, I've been in the US since 1975. So I've lived there longer than in my own country. It took me this many years to realize that I have gained the license to be a critique of American society. I know this country really well. 
I, 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 I love and hate this country. I know the, the, all the sides to it, and I am grateful for this country to give me a home. I worship many of its values, but as a country that gives you the freedom of expression, which my country doesn't, I give myself the license to critique it, especially at this point of history, which was totally different than when I first came to this country. But I wanted to do it not in a didactic way. I didn't want to, it's so easy to make polemical work where it points fingers at, at power structures. And so if the woman of Allah, my past work, were about Iran, but from the outsider perspective, really keeping myself on the outside, I thought now I give my perspective about America from an immigrant's perspective. This is not an American perspective. The portraiture is what I see America as. And, and, and the, finally, this connection between the dreams and being the core of this project was because dreams cross borders. First of all, dreams are innocent, and we cannot judge them. But dreams are so that whether you're in Italy or in Iran or in the United States, very often human dreams are very common. They're expression of their fears and anxieties of displacement, violence, sickness, you know, dis displacement, abandonment, all of these issues that I think are quite global. So as a way of approaching America, I thought to go after dreams again, being of the land of dreams, so it's... Like a, like a dream catcher, yeah. but uh, also it's quite a slippery ground because you go, as you say, uh, uh, in the land of fears also, dreams. And, and it's true that in the video and also in the movie tonight, uh, there are not happy dreams. It's more dreams which tell stories about the fears and the situation. And the alter ego, seems more and more sensitive to that. Yes, we made the video and the photographs in 2019, which was at the height of people's anxiety with Trump doing all that he was doing. In 2020, we shot the movie during the pandemic and during the election. So the, there was an extreme anxiety about um, the people. But one thing I want to mention is that, you know, I've always felt like an outsider within the American community, the same way I, I know we have a lot of Iranian people here, but having lived outside of Iran, I feel for so long an outsider. So I felt like a, I never belonged to anywhere, any group. But being joined in New Mexico, particularly because it's one of the poorest states in America, but also one of the most diverse demographics, being with the Native Americans, talking to them about their sense of displacement, talking to the Hispanic immigrants, and getting to know other minorities living in America at that point of history was really reassuring for me. And I felt that I gained a new sense of support and belief in a community in America that I lacked before in New York. And so on a personal level, this was a really important project for me that I, once I felt an American, even though I always say emotionally, politically, everything, I'm Iranian, Iranian, for the first time I felt that I belong to this tapestry of America that are a bunch of immigrants or people that are displaced. And, and this was really important to me, especially making this work during the pandemic and during the election. So um, we come back to the personal side of your work, but also to the autobiographical. So Land of Dreams is a very autobiographical work inside your art. Yes, uh, I talk, um, yes, I, it's true um, that I live in America for a long time, but I've never really integrated completely. And in fact, when I was in New Mexico, in preparation for the video, I went door to door to choose the households to and to film in there for the video. And, and I would knock at the door and say, hi, I'm an Iranian um, artist. I'm trying to make a film about American culture and I'm just interested to talk to you and see if I can photograph you and ask you for your dreams. 
And literally, some people would say, get lost. <laughs> and then some people would say, I remember this couple who were really older. They first, and exactly you'll see in a few minutes, just like in the video, they opened the video, uh, the, um, they opened the curtain, and they saw me and all the Iranian group, because we were all Iranian. They were like, they never see Iranians before. And they were very hesitant to open the door. And then um, the, the guy said, oh, come on in. And then he said, oh, I was in the military. Uh, I was in Iran, and they became very curious. But there were a few instances where I went, and they absolutely want to have nothing to do with us. There were Republicans, there were Democrats. But just like in the video, as this woman does go and try to reach out to Americans, I did that, and I became friends with them. But again, um, it was not so much autobiographical, because of course I did this, but um, it was personal, Heinz. I think in the way that I see this, of course, Iran and America have this long history of antagonism. America is supposed to be our enemy. And we are supposed to be Americans' enemy. And so oftentimes, there are a lot of Americans, when you introduce yourself as Iranian, there's a bit of a tension there. So I've, I've experienced this kind of subtle racism um, but this film is about breaking all of those rules. More the film or the video? I mean, we don't want to talk too much about the, the movie. Uh, let's talk more about the video, which you will see later on, um, without uh, uh, giving any spoilers for tonight's movie, which is uh, still, uh, which is quite different in the narration. But. Land of Dreams, the video also was new for you because you, as you said, you did a lot of research and you were uh, trying to understand America and the surroundings. So um, what made you, made you, uh, uh, what gave you, what did give you the idea to do first Land of Dreams, the, fil the, the, the video and then the movie? It's actually exactly for the reason we're here today, we're talking about art and cinema. For me, it was a very interesting idea to take a single idea that can collapse into photography, video installation, and cinema. Now, talking about the videos, as you know, my earlier um, videos, the characters were more like sculptural. If you think of, if some of you know my videos, I never went into the psychological depth of the characters. They never spoke. They were just more used like statues. I was wondering whether I can now bring my experience in filmmaking, but yet go back to my more lyrical, enigmatic videos that were experienced in multiple channel projections. But now, opposite to the movies, where you're passively sitting watching a film, in a gallery museum setting, you as the audience really have the task of being the editor of the video because the two channels are projected side by side. So therefore, you have to digest the two narratives playing simultaneous at the same time. So therefore, in my mind, the gallery museum video installation requires a more active participation of the audience, where with the movies, theaters, you can be more lazy. And so in terms of the type of storytelling, in terms of the pacing, um, development, uh, use of language, it's completely different. Um, but in this video, I try to infuse everything I learned about cinema and bring together my aesthetic from video art. But also in an earlier movie, like such as uh, Looking for Umgal Tum, which you presented here too, um, and which is a more, let's say, straightly narrative and uh, more conventional in a certain sense. You always uh, have a system of references to your own artistic work, which means the camera movements which uh, uh, look alike or which you use again, or uh, uh, your way of describing the, the women characters also, because there is always something mysterious and uh, surreal or around them. It's a, it's a good point because I oft, often think about 
other artists who are making movies? And at what point do they negotiate between cinema and art? And for example, uh, Heinz, we have people like Steve McQueen or Julian Schnabel, which in my mind, they keep their art and film work very separate. If you can think about Julian Schnabel, he makes pretty much conventional film. The same with Steve McQueen. But Matthew Barney, it's completely art. With me, it's 50-50. I've always been interested about how I can take my visual and conceptual aesthetic signature into the cinematic language. I have no interest in conventional cinema. But I also don't want to make an extended, long video installation. I think it's boring. I think for the audience, it's frustrating. So while my work is still slower in pacing, has been about how to develop scripts, narratives that come directly from my photography and video work, but yet have the sense of development, continuity, pacing, comprehensibility that is necessary for a cinematic production. And, and still, I think my film are super art house films, but the reason you see very often some of my own ideas repeated in my films is simply because that's like a painter who paints and certain lines and certain things keep repeating themselves. And I think that's a kind of good because it gives the audience a sense of continuity and constancy while a lot is changing. Uh, and sometimes it happens subconsciously. So, so the audience rec recognizes the same artists they know from museums when they will see a movie. Land of Dreams, the video also was uh, a certain break in, because as you said before, you, you went, you had another research, you had probably a, a bigger team. You were with a whole group of people uh, uh, in New Mexico. Can you describe uh, uh, how you work as a filmmaker, which is more extreme even because the team is bigger. Also in Land of Dreams, the movie, you work for the first time with a legendary uh, scriptwriter Jean-Claude Carrière, but, but with a professional scriptwriter. Normally, you and Shoja, you did your scripts more, more or less yourself, alone. Absolutely, I, 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 but I also want to hint on something that I forgot to mention, <clears throat> the sense of duality, um, because it's something for, for our audience to keep in mind that we'll see the film later as well, that in everything that I do, including the woman of Allah, there's been this paradoxical nature. But in the videos, there's been men, women, nature, culture, mysticism, violence. And like Land of Dreams, also dreams have a foot in reality and a foot in absolute subliminal. And so I'm in, in these videos, you have the colony, which represents Iran. On the other side, you have America. You have this claustrophobic um, interior space of an Iranian colony, and then you had the previous uh, open space. So these ideas that existed in the video continued in the, in the film. Again, um, being uh, when we were writing the script with Jean-Claude, we started very much on a conceptual basis that there is this Iranian woman who is basically haunted by her own past, her own difficult political history back in Iran, but she stands in America, who itself as a nation is very problematic. So she's facing two worlds that are simultaneously problematic. And so there's this shift between this single individual person's dilemma and history, yet the bigger picture about America. So when we went to Jean-Claude, and, and you know, of course, Jean-Claude Carrier, for the young people who are not here, he passed away, unfortunately, this last January. He was 89. He, lived, um, uh, he worked with Louis Bonuel, one of the greatest filmmakers, and he's responsible for one of the, some of the greatest scripts. The, what Jean-Claude brings to this script, I think is really important with the help of Shoja Azari, is the surrealism, the satire, absurdity, humor that I don't have in my film. Um, and, and so the film is still quite surrealistic, but it, it, it had this continuous um, narrative that came from someone like him. I, yes, I wanted to talk about the humor because it's yeah. true that, that the movie, compared to your former works and films and videos, has a certain surrealistic humor, but you uh, 
prepared already the way to this humor because you are used to to use uh, certain you use you use certain cliches. For instance, the Western landscape. We think more of Arizona than of uh, than of New Mexico and, and John Ford, or for the Iranian colony, which is uh, in the movie very f full of very funny in the description of the uniforms and, and of the. Uh, island inside the desert, so to say. It, it's a really good point. Um, I want to say that if you took an American to Iran, they would absolutely go to for what is most exotic about Iran, right? And what is exotic for me in America is the Southwest. Mm -hmm. uh, it's like the road movies or the, um, you know, Paris, Texas, or like Wim Wenders from Germany went, um, the, the, where the cowboys are, where the natives are, where spectacular landscape, which by the way resembled Iran. So in the video, we wanted to sort of confuse people in terms of, is this story taking place in Iran or in America? But for me, absolutely, you're right. Uh, being that the work is from the perspective of an immigrant, it, it was really geared in terms of capturing an aspect of America that is attractive to me in its, in its beauty of landscape, but it's problematic because it's one of the poorest states in America. The New Mexico, it's, and the situation with the Native Americans, by the way, is catastrophic, uh, living in the reservations. Um, and so it, it was a bit of a political act, and yet it was a celebration of, uh, of America. What I wanted to also re make a reference to what you said, satire, to me is about absurdity. If you think about the absurdity of the Iranian Islamic Republic of Iran, the government of Khomeini, Khomeini uh, and how it succeeded to rule and, and the, the kind of conspiracy that they have spread out through the country. And think about America and the idea, the way that the fanaticism and the, the absurdity of the Trump's administration and the way that he was able to succeed to have such a following and the way that we have now in Texas banned abortion so the idea that in this movie that you'll see tonight, that the American government will actually collect people's dreams, it's not that unimaginable. Like in the Iranian society, believe me, they're doing outrageous things. So the use of humor, absurdity, and satire for me was really a reference to a lot of our governments and that are looking more and more like theater actors and sort of absurd. But, but, but as you just said, that the, the, the idea of conspiracy is, has been for a long time uh, in Iran since Khomeini and, and it's, it's something new for America. So it's no, uh, uh, no chance that you turn, you look onto America in a m moment where certain things uh, repeat themselves in the system. And America is not anymore as a positive system, so to say, as an uh, inclusive system, as it used to be, as we thought it would be. Or maybe we can put it more simply that Iran is starting to look more and more like America, or America is starting to look more and more like Iran uh, in, in, in the way that um, their power structure works in terms of the amount of corruption and the political injustice, racism. Um, I, I mean, I, I don't, please, um, I, I, you have to understand that um, I really worship the country that I live in. I don't want to live anywhere else. But there are things to criticize Amer America, like its foreign intervention, foreign policy in places like Afghanistan. So um, it's a very problematic society at the time, going through a major shift. And, and, but this is a very, this work, it's not meant to be anything other than a more poetic and satirical way into looking at America, one other thing that you and I talked about that I forgot to mention, there's something very important about this connection between photography and dreams. For me, photography is about freezing a moment. So, you know, you capture an image and it becomes permanent. But dreams vanish immediately. They are so impermanent. So there is something very powerful about this connection that I find that it's difficult to explain. Um, but, but you have been using photography all, 
always, as, as I said before, non-psychological portraits. It's always, you know, uh, uh, a frontal view. People most often are, at least, are look, watching us, looking at us, at the camera. And you have a certain uh, uh, frame, which is that we see their faces very well. Sometimes the body with the tattoos and so, but mostly it's really a, a classical portrait situation. Coming yes. from Prairie I, I, Coming I, from I am interested in human portraiture because I'm very interested in emotions. And to me, nothing is more powerful than human portraiture when it comes. Yes, with the moving picture, you could use a little music and choreography and sound and all of these ways to enhance the emotional climax. But when you're talking about um, an image or gaze of a human being where with the subtle gesture you can feel all the pain and the sorrow, um, it's very powerful. It's extremely powerful. Uh, I cannot um, photograph a landscape or a tree or uh, a table or whatever. I need uh, the human emotions. Um, there is, um, I give it away, I think maybe there is even an image that Julia put at the very end of the movie um, which we can talk about later, where she surrounds herself with photographs of her family, but also the people that she photographed, which I photographed. And there's something very um, powerful about a suitcase full of images that she's brought from her past that represents her personal life, isolated, and then the photographs that she takes of other people, and then she lays them all in the same place. It is as if saying that, for me, that I finally reconciling who I am as an Iranian and as an American, as an Orient and an Occident, that we are all part of this whole planet. And oddly enough, when we were filming that scene, suddenly a strong wind came, and we had carefully, on a spiral way, put the personal family pictures next to American pictures, and the wind started to throw the images all over, and they all got mixed up, and it's like, oh my God, I was like, like cry. And, and that was really the meaning of the film. With the pandemic, whether you were in Italy or in Iran, two countries that were hit the most, or America, that taught us a great lesson. It's about our humanity and how pain and suffering doesn't know any borders. Um, maybe on that note. <laughs> no, no, no. I have more. One more question. <laughs> maybe it's a stupid question. I'm sorry for that. I apologize. But why do you use black and white for the video and color for the movie? You know, um, you can't capture the Southwest. Uh, I mean, I did in the video. Um, but the, the movie was meant to be like a road movie, like, um, you know, to really go into the characteristic of the Southwest, um, the cowboy look of Matt Dillon and the color of the desert versus her, you know. And, and, and these colors were really fundamental, even though we desaturated. Um, and, and, you know, even though I have to say the movie also never landed in reality, it was always unbelievable, but there was a hint of realism that in the video, it was completely gone. Uh, in the video, you could as well be 50 years ahead or 50 years in the past. There was this sense of timelessness that comes with black and white where the color gives it away. And, and, and I think with my photography also, I feel it's so important to me the people that I photograph don't appear contemporary, that there is something about it that you can't put your finger on it. Um, and that's black and white. That, that fits together with the way that for the movie you work for the first time with famous professional actors. Because they give a realistic play game, which is not reality, which is not documentary, which it's their way of playing, but it's, they do it in a very credible way, but it's more dramatic than uh, in, in the black and white video. Am I right? Or is but it there's a difference as well. Like, I think with the photography and, and the video, it was about um, tapping into the marginalized community 
people who are poor, people who are deprived, the isolated, the natives, the, the blacks. And, but with the movie, it was about American, iconic Americans. Matt Dillon, to me, was the epitome of an American iconic character, the and modern also. cowboy. And it had to be someone who it was believable who could play that role. Isabella Rossellini was like an Italian immigrant who married a rich American living in a ranch in New Mexico, which is very believable. Um, and so for me, it was, um, you know, if the, the nature, the landscape was the iconic American landscape, the characters were also iconic American characters, if that makes any sense. You haven't seen the movie. So Anna Gunn, you know, or Christopher McDonald, there are faces in Hollywood that you really represent, you, are, you recognize as American stars that somehow, you know, have that sense of Americano, you know. Thank you very much, Shirin. Thank yeah. you. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. I have to.